everyone, thanks for joining this session. Welcome to Container Based Development with Visual Studio Code. My name is Bridget Murtaugh, and I'm a program manager on the Visual Studio Code team here at Microsoft. So let's kick off the session with a bit of a scenario. Let's say that you're starting on a new project. Super exciting, right? So what are some of the first things that you think about when you're starting on something new? You may be thinking about your ideas for contributing. You may be thinking about what are the best practices that the project follows, or who are some of your teammates that you could reach out to to learn more about how the code base works. And one of the less exciting parts that you may have to think about are what are the prereqs in the tech stacks that the project requires, and how long is it going to take to configure your machine to be able to properly run and execute those tech stacks? But what if you could start on any new project and have your development environment already configured for you. Let's break it down even further. What if you could instantly get the tools you needed for each new project that you work on, regardless of what you have installed locally? So whether you're starting on a Java project or a Go project, you could independently work in each of those environments, and it doesn't matter whether you have Java installed locally or what version of Java you do or don't have installed locally. You could just work inside a Java environment for that new project, and everything would run as expected. Or in the case of a tech stack like Python, where you may have to manage different versions of it, you could do that pretty easily, and you wouldn't have to worry about um, something like installing or uninstalling different versions of that tech stack. What if? Once you have your setup configured and you're able to easily hop in and out of different projects, you could actually share that setup, let's say by uploading it to GitHub. So that way your teammates could share all of the same tools and get started on your project just as quickly. And also what if, because we love Visual Studio Code, you could do all this work within VS Code, taking advantage of extensions and debugging and completions the full experience of VS Code. Well, I'm here to say that this, all of these what ifs, this experience is fully possible today. And it's possible through the VS Code Remote Containers extension, which allows us to develop within a Docker container and use these different Docker containers, which we refer to as development containers or dev containers to um, isolate our work so that way we can isolate and work in a Python dev container for one project and a Node.js dev container for a completely different project. And we can take advantage of all those different what ifs that I just went through before. So rather than going through more slides, let's go ahead and hop into some demos and see remote containers in action in VS Code. All right, so here we are in Visual Studio Code. And let's go ahead and make sure that we have the correct extensions installed. So I'm going to go ahead and search up remote containers. And cool, we can see that I have the extension installed. And it allows us to open any folder or repo inside a Docker container. Um, so that sounds pretty awesome. So let's see what it takes. And also, it's worth noting that I already have Docker installed and running on my system. And when we searched up remote containers, we can see that's actually not the only remote extension that's available in VS Code. In VS Code, we really want to make remote development applicable to you and whatever the needs for your project or your team are. So we also have some other remote development extensions too, including Remote WSL, which allows you to take advantage of the Windows subsystem for Linux, which actually gives you a real Linux kernel on a Windows machine. So that way you can execute Linux commands and uh, different applications. And it feels like you're really developing within Linux, even though you're on a Windows computer, which is pretty cool. We also have remote SSH, uh, which allows you to open folders or machines on remote boxes. So you can connect to remote desktop machines or remote virtual machines to get even more power or specific tech stacks on a different remote box. So we have tons of different options depending on the needs or preferences for your project. So let's go ahead and see what happens now that we have remote containers installed and we have Docker installed and running. So whenever we have any of the remote extensions installed in VS Code in the lower left-hand corner, we're going to have this green remote indicator. And that's going to be our central point into remote commands in Visual Studio Code. And we can see that there's different sections here depending on the remote command. Um, so if we take a look at the remote containers commands, 
we can see that we have the options, for instance, to open different folders or workspaces and containers. And we also have the option to work with container volumes. Um, so once we have the project set up to work with a container, we can actually go ahead and work with it in a volume, which is pretty great. Um, we even have this option to um, try a container sample. And so I'm kind of wondering what that looks like and if we can get started with a container super quick and easily. So let's see what that's about. All right, so we can see that we have a few different language options right off the bat that lets you just hop into a dev container environment really quick and easy. Um, if you're curious about what a dev container looks like and how remote containers works in VS Code. So out of all of these, um, I know, for instance, when I've worked with Python, um, that can take a while to install my machine and manage different versions of it. So let's go ahead and try hopping into a Python sample app. So we can see here that our container starts up. And whenever we start into a new remote environment in VS Code, it's going to install this server component. And then once that server component installs on the remote side, so in this case on the uh, dev container side, that's going to then allow us to have that full power of VS Code, so syntax highlighting and completions. And for instance, we just saw that I already can set a breakpoint and things like that. Um, OK. And now we can see that in the lower left-hand corner, I have where it says dev container Python 3. So it's telling me that, hey, I'm connected to a dev container, and it's a Python 3 dev container. Um, so let's go ahead and see what allowed us to do that. So what we want to take note of is that whenever we're working with a dev container, we have this dot dev container folder. And within that, we have a dev container JSON and we have a Docker file. So a dev container JSON is essentially going to be a file that tells VS Code how to spin up and connect to our um, dev container environment. So it can include some information like a name for our container. So for instance, Python 3, that's how we got the name there. It can include where the Docker file is located. So here's Docker file. Um, it can include some other build arguments and a variety of settings. So if Python, there's a variety of different settings, such as some path and linting information. And so all that is taken care of already automatically in this dev container, which is really convenient. And we can even install some extensions automatically. So if I go over to the extensions viewlet, we can see that I already have um, the appropriate extensions installed in this dev container. It's also worth noting that when working in remote contexts, so in remote containers, but also even in remote WSL and remote SSH, we have this concept of locally installed extensions and remotely installed extensions. So locally installed extensions are going to be things like your theme and UI extensions. Whereas remotely installed extensions are going to be everything else. So things like the Python extension and PyLance. Um, so kind of those like heavier lifting extensions. All right, and we can see then we have some other properties like we can forward ports, but we actually don't have to do that statically. VS Code is great at doing it dynamically. Um, so for instance, uh, it's going to go ahead and give us some behavior when this port gets forwarded, and we can even set a label for it when it's automatically forwarded. And we can even have this really cool property known as post create command, which will automatically run um, certain commands after the container is created. So for instance, this container is automatically going to run a pip3 install and install our requirements.txt after the container is created. And finally, there's a variety of other properties that you can include in your dev container JSON. This one wraps up our dev container JSON with remote user, which allows us to either include it or comment it out, depending on the level of root access we want within our container. And then if we just go ahead and open up the Docker file, we can see that it's standard Docker file syntax. We can include an image to pull from. So we're pulling a Python image to get this Python environment. And we can also install some other software tools uh, including Node, for instance, in this environment. So let's go ahead and just try running this container. So I'm going to go ahead and do an F5. All right, and it tells us that our app is running on port 9000. So let's go ahead and open it in the browser. <laughs> 
so we can see VS Code can do that. Yes, it can. Um, so that was super easy to just go ahead and get started with a dev container for Python. And it didn't even matter if I had Python on my local system or not. I didn't even need to check that because within this dev environment, if I go back over here, I can just check Python version. I have Python in this container because if I go and check on my local machine, do I have Python? Doesn't look like I do. And so it doesn't matter that I don't have Python 3 or any version of Python on my local machine. As long as I have it in this dev container, I can go ahead and run Python 3 applications, which is great. So this was just a really quick, simple example of getting started with a dev container. And actually behind the scenes, any of these try a dev container samples are going to use the concept of a container volume. And if I go over to the remote explorer over here, which is this icon, I can go ahead and click in the drop down. And I can view a variety of my remote targets. And when I'm specifically focusing on the containers, I can see different dev containers that I have and which one is specifically running. Um, so this green icon, I'm specifically connected to my TryPython container and um, some information about it here, and I'm connected to it. Um, I can see the attributes for the dev container that I'm currently in. And then we can also see this concept of dev volumes. So a volume, if you're not familiar with it, there's technically two ways to manage or store the um, files that you work with containers. There's volumes, which are completely taken care of and managed by Docker. There's also bind mounts. Um, so you can mount the files in your container. Volumes are the preferred mechanism. They're more efficient, managed by Docker. And so remote containers allows us to use volumes. And it also allows us to then explore those volumes. So for instance, we can see different volumes that we've worked with here in the remote containers extension. All right, so here from our initial example, this is a great intro into remote containers and some of the concepts here. But what if I wanted to see maybe a little bit more of an example for a project that I'm currently working on and not just like a, a sample or getting started project like this? Let's go ahead and see how that might work. In the lower left-hand corner here, I'm gonna click here and I'm gonna close my remote connection for now. All right, cool. And now in the lower left, this is going to become our best friend. I'm going to again open up this remote indicator. And now I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm actually going to harness both of the power of remote WSL and remote containers. So with remote WSL, um, I typically, since I'm on a Windows machine, I like going ahead and storing my files on the WSL file system. Um, with WSL, the WSL file system is actually a separate file system from your Windows file system. And it's recommended to store your files there um, since it is more efficient for access. So I'm going to say open folder in WSL. This is going to open up a file explorer. And these files are actually on the WSL file system. So I'm going to select a project here that I've been working on. And now when I open it up, VS Code is going to start up again, and it's going to start up remotely. And now in the lower left, we can see that we're connected to WSL, and we're specifically connected to an Ubuntu distribution. With WSL, it's really cool. You can actually grab new distros through the Microsoft Store. Really convenient. Um, and out of curiosity, if I type in something like Uname, it looks like I'm developing on Linux, even though I'm on a Windows machine. All right, so if I open up the README for this project, I can see that, for instance, it has some prereqs like Node.js and .NET Core 3.1. And so typically when I'm starting on a new project or something like that, and I want to know where to get started and how to be able to run it properly, I'm going to go ahead and open up the README and look at the prereqs. So let's go ahead and see what we might want to do here. And also just to give a little bit of background on this application, we're calling this a group calling application. So it's essentially something like a Teams or a Zoom where you can have these calling sessions with your friends or your teammates. And so when I'm starting a new app, I'll look at the prereqs, I'll look through the code structure and I'll think about, okay, I probably need to go download those prereqs, maybe explore how the code structure looks and things like that. 
But the cool thing about using dev containers, like we just saw in the previous example, is I didn't need to go worry about, oh, do I have Python on my local machine? No, I don't. I need to go figure out what version of Python I need and go and install it and make sure it doesn't conflict with any other versions of Python I have and things like that. I can actually just go ahead and create a .dev container folder for this project. So I could go ahead and create it by hand. So I could create the dev container JSON and the Docker file um, manually in here. But the cool thing is remote containers actually has a command that guides us through that process and includes some out of the box definitions for uh, different types of tech stacks. So let's see how it works. In the lower left here, I'm going to click now in the remote container section, add development container configuration files. Once this loads up, Remote Containers is actually pretty smart, and it's able to detect what type of files that we have in our application. So it's able to say, hey, I think you may have some Node.js files, so maybe you want a Node.js and TypeScript dev container. Or, hey, I think you may have some C-sharp files, maybe you want a C-sharp.net dev container. And more than just that, we have a variety of other definitions too. So even have some more complex definitions, like we have different ones with Azure Functions. We have Docker in Docker and Docker from Docker. Um, but for the purposes of this one, I think that C-sharp would be a great fit. So I'll select C-sharp. And then Remote Containers allows us to continue customizing our environment. So remember in the prereqs, it said that I needed .NET Core 3.1. So I'll select 3.1. And then I can customize it even further. So I remember that I needed Node.js, so I'm going to leave that option checked. I don't think I need the Azure CLI, so I'm going to leave that option unchecked. And I'll say OK. All right, so now we can see we have this .dev container folder, and Remote Containers notifies us now, hey, it looks like your folder contains dev container configuration files. You can reopen your folder to develop in a container. So whenever we open up a project, um, if we just clone it from GitHub or something like that, and it already has this .dev container folder, Remote Containers notifies us because it's able to detect that we have this folder or that we have a dev container JSON, and it's going to prompt us to reopen in our dev container. So again, we're going to see that we have some similar properties in this dev container JSON, uh, but they're going to be tailored now for the needs of this application. So for instance, the name is going to be different. And we're going to have some different uh, options here. So for instance, we're installing Node, and we're not installing the Azure CLI. And we can also install some different extensions. So right now, we're installing the C-sharp extension by default, which I think totally makes sense. And I think I'd actually like to also install another extension. Our team creates and manages this extension called the GitHub Pull Request and Issues extension. I totally recommend checking it out. I load it up here. And it allows you to stay completely within VS Code when working with your pull requests and really closing that inner loop for source control. So what I can do is I can right click on it and I can say add to dev container JSON. And there we go. We can see that the ID populates in the list of extensions. And then we're going to see some similar options here. In this case, the post create command, I'm going to uncomment it because I think it'd be really useful to run a .NET restore on this C Sharp project. And I'm going to actually go ahead and make it a little bit more specific for this application and have it point to where our .csproj file is located. Cool. I'll save that, close out of this. And then also, if I just open up the Docker file, we can see that we're pulling, for instance, a .NET image now. And we can see that we're installing uh, Node.js, and we're not installing the Azure CLI. But we totally could later on if we wanted to. And I'm going to comment this out for now. OK. And then one other component is here is that we have this library scripts concept that I don't think we had before in the Python dev container. And that's, for instance, where we're going to have something like installing the Azure CLI that comes in through a script. OK, so now that we have explored our dev container JSON and our Docker file, we can go ahead and reopen and start developing within this dev container. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is in the lower left now, Again, click on that remote indicator, and now we can reopen in container. OK, so now we're going to see that we are starting in our dev container. 
and we can see that we have everything loaded up here. So we can see that we have first the C-sharp extension is going to prompt us if we'd like to go ahead and add some build assets. So I'm going to say yes, and that's going to add our .vs code folder, which is going to help us run our application. But we can see we have all the same files here. And now it's going to tell us that we're connected to our dev container. So now let's go ahead and check out what version of .NET that we have in this environment. Cool, so I have .NET 3.1. And remember, I didn't have .NET locally. And technically, I could have gone ahead and installed .NET in my WSL environment like I was in previously. But um, I may not want to have .NET 3.1 specifically in WSL. Maybe I'm going to work on different projects that require different versions of .NET. Or maybe I'm not using .NET all that often. So it's just a lot easier to be able to hop into dev containers that already have .NET configured for me. All right. So now let's go ahead and try running this application. I'm going to go over to the run and debug view lip. We can see we have this option to launch it. And let's launch our app. So we can see we're doing a .NET restore. And then we're told our application is running on port 5000. So it's super nice that VS Code uh, dynamically port forwards for us. So let's go ahead and open our app in a browser. And there we go. Here is our group calling application, just as we expected to see it. And we're able to run it completely from VS Code in a development container. Awesome. I'll go back to my VS Code. I'm going to go ahead and stop running our app. And now that we've gone ahead and added this dev container, I think it would be super useful for when I use this app in the future, and if any of my teammates use this app, to already have this dev container configured. So the awesome thing is we can go ahead and commit it directly to the repo uh, with source control. And that way, whenever we go ahead and open up this repo in VS Code, uh, we'll be prompted by the remote containers extension. Hey, do you want to reopen this uh, project in a dev container? We can say yes. We'll have all the dependencies we need, and we can just start developing. So let's go ahead and try that out. So rather than committing directly to the main branch, I'm going to go ahead and create a new branch. And using that GitHub pull request and issues extension, I'm going to create a pull request into main. And I can do it all directly from VS Code without having to leave the editor. So I'll click main. I'll say create new branch. And I'll say add container info. I can publish this branch to my current fork that I'm working on but it did also detect the upstream. And we can see that the pull request extension or he says, hey, do you want to create a pull request? But not quite yet. I want to go ahead and commit my changes first to this branch. So I'm going to say add config. And I'm going to add pretty much everything, but I don't think I need to add the Azure CLI script. Cool, so I can stage and commit all of those and push them up to my branch. All right, and now the pull request extension has added this create pull request button really conveniently. And I can choose to merge my changes from my current repo and branch. And I can choose to merge them either into the upstream, but I'm going to keep them on my current branch or on my current repo just into the main. And I'll say add dev container. I can add a description for the PR. I'd like to add a dev container to this repo. Go ahead and create it. And now we're brought to this PR overview page where it's really nice. We get a full GitHub PR experience directly within our editor. We can add things like reviewers and milestones and assign people. And we can even do things like pop into a file and add a comment. So we can say, I like this image. And I could add a comment or even start a whole review. And if I'd like to, I could go ahead and either open this in the browser, or I could merge the pull request directly from VS Code. To show that it is a true pull request, I'll go ahead and open it in the browser. So I'll click on it here. We can see that it really exists. We can see the comments that I left. And I'll go ahead and merge it in from the browser. And there we go. And now the cool thing is, is now that this repo has a dev container, 
I can actually go ahead and open up this exact same configured environment using the dev container in GitHub Code Spaces, because GitHub Code Spaces takes advantage of the same dev container format as remote containers. So what I could do is I'll copy that part here and I'll open up my code spaces section here. Let's go ahead and create a new code space on this repo. And when we go ahead and create a code space, rather than creating a code space on what's known as the kitchen sink image, which includes the default set of a variety of tech stacks um, out of the box, it's gonna prepare our code space on this container that we set up in our uh, dev container with our dev container JSON and our Docker file. So it's preparing our code space. And now we're popped into our code space. We can see how fast that was, even with a custom image. We're installing some C sharp dependencies. Those are installed. Okay, and now it tells us that we're on a custom image, so Codespace is able to detect that. And I know that in the default code space with that kitchen sink, it uses the long-term support version of a variety of tech stacks. So for instance, it would use .NET um, 5.0. But if I check the version of .NET we have here, we have .NET 3.1, which was the version we set up in our dev container. So the changes took effect, and we're able to have the same exact environment, both in remote containers and in code spaces, which is awesome. Thanks so much for joining our session on development containers in VS Code. Uh, we have some further resources that we'd love for you to check out. So for instance, we have our documentation, which dives even more into some great details on development containers and the remote containers extension. We have a dedicated GitHub repo to the remote extensions in Visual Studio Code. So that way you can engage with our engineering team and file some issues and feature requests. We also have available those definitions that come in from that add development container configuration files command. And that command is actually available both in remote containers and code spaces. So you can go ahead and check out the definitions that come in at that GitHub repo. And you could even try contributing one because we do accept community contributions. We also have a video series dedicated to getting started with and modifying and using dev containers. So we'd recommend checking that out too. I've included my Twitter handle, which is at Bridget Murtal, and the VS Code Twitter handle, which is at Code. And we're super active on there and would love to hear your feedback and connect with you on there too. Thanks so much again and happy coding.